Hello everyone, welcome, it's Gihan Pereira here, and welcome to this, um, I want to call it presentation and meeting, talking about artificial intelligence in education. So in the time that we've got together, I want to share with you some ideas about AI in the education sector, and also give you the chance to share ideas and ask questions of other people in the room as well. So before we get into the topic, let me give you some uh, rules of engagement. These are my three standard uh, suggestions for getting the most out of this meeting here. And um, so I will be presenting to start with, but it won't be all the time. So normally, if this was just a presentation or me running a, a masterclass where it's mostly me presenting, I would spotlight myself so that you see me on the big screen uh, and everybody else is in, in little windows. Uh, can I suggest to you that while I'm presenting that, uh, because I'm not going to spotlight today, can I suggest to you that while I'm presenting, you um, go into speaker view on Zoom so that my slides, they don't turn up to be tiny little things. And then you can go back to gallery view if you want to. I'm going to have gallery view open so I can see all your names here uh, and then we'll, um, we'll take it from there. Okay, so my rules of engagement. First of all, I want to give you some things to think about today uh, and think about what this, what AI is going to mean for you when you finish. So when you, when you walk out of this session, what value are you going to take away from it and put into action? And the second one is be a bit playful. And by playful, I mean two things. So one is participate, especially today, because there'll be opportunities for you to uh, ask questions, uh, share ideas with other people, answer other people's questions, ask me questions. So the more you participate, the more you'll get out of it. Um, and the second part of being playful is uh, be okay to think a little bit outside the constraints that you normally have in your workplace and in your day-to-day -day work, because it's better to think big now and then walk it back later if you need to, than to try to think bigger after you, like after the world gets in the way. So yeah, just, just participate, make the most of, make the most of this. And as I said, I really want to give you the chance to take some things away that you can put into action. Uh, I have prepared more content than I need. So if there's no conversation going on, then don't worry. I'm a professional speaker. I can speak long after you stop listening. So I've got plenty of content, So, but I'd rather not use all of it. Uh, and I've got stuff that I've set aside uh, that I can bring in. If somebody asks a question, you can ask me or ask other people in the group. In terms of asking questions, there are three ways you could do it. So one is if you want to keep your camera off and your audio off at all times, that's fine. Um, use a chat room, use a Zoom chat. If you want to keep your camera off, but ask questions just by uh, turning your microphone on, that's okay as well. Um, and if you want to turn your video on, if you're in a, a scenario where you feel comfortable doing that, please do that too. Now, I am recording this and uh, we'll send the recording to everybody who registers, not only the people who are here, people who are registering. So if you're watching the recording now, hello, you're probably not going to get as much value as if you're here live, but I'm sure you will still get some value from this. Okay, so let's get into this. So AI, AI is really big at the moment. Everyone's talking about it. And I've been following it for a long time. I found this slide from five years ago when I was talking to leaders about the future of leadership in 2018. And I was saying, here's how leadership has changed in each block of five years. And I said, 10 years ago, which was the start of really social media. And in a way, the iPhones and smartphones were also becoming popular. Uh, leadership was all about um, technology. And then I said five years ago, remember this is 2018, five years ago, remember the shift that we had moving from jobs to skills and starting to talk about uh, having this broad range of skills, not just having deep expertise in your, in your specific area. Um, and then I said, now, 2018, it's all about talent. And you remember the war for talent uh, about five years ago. And I said, what's coming up in five years time is AI. AI. And of course, that's what's happened now. And, and we'd have to incorporate AI into our workplaces. And, and I kind of knew this. And I knew this. And I didn't know it's a, it was going to be exactly five years when ChatGPT would come up and everyone was talking about it. But I've been following AI for a long time. My uni degree at the University of Western Australia in computer science, my thesis was about artificial intelligence. So we were talking about AI even at that time. It's just that 
at the time, it was um, still in its early days. And I'll explain that in a sec, because it'll be useful to understand what it's become now. Um, but it wasn't just because I had a personal interest in it or professional interest. Uh, I've always, as a futurist, been, fo been following trends. And uh, Gartner, every year, they have this, what they call their hype cycle. And they're talking about trends, and they have graphs like this. Um, don't worry about the detail in this graph. The thing to look at in this is, uh, I'm not going to go through this in any detail at all, but there's a few light blue spots. There's four of them. And that's what Gartner was predicting, was the technology that was just a couple of years away. This was again in 2018. Um, and AI was three of those four light blue spots. So I knew that AI was going to be pretty big. It already was actually, but um, you know, Gartner was saying this is the next big thing. And I was telling everybody, uh, this is the next big thing. You might've even um, heard me talking about it uh, in some of the work that I've done with you if you're a client of mine. So, AI now we know is, is huge, and it's because of ChatGPT having made this mainstream now. So previously, AI was happening behind the scenes. Lots of people knew about it. It's happening in a lot of industries, but it was happening behind the scenes. And now ChatGPT has just shown everybody um, how powerful it is. Um, so, in fact, there are two kinds of AI, two kinds of artificial intelligence. Um, and I'm not going to go through the whole process of how AI has evolved, but it's useful to understand these two things. So one is machine learning, and the other one is um, expert systems. Exp expert systems came first. Now what we have is mostly machine learning. And a lot of AI is a combination of these two. But the way it used to work, and when we were studying AI in um, at UWA 30 years ago, um, most of AI was around expert systems. And the idea of that was that you would try to talk to an expert in a field, uh, get all of their knowledge, and then program it in software. So for example, this is uh, Dr. Nikki Stamp. She's one of Australia's leading cardiothoracic surgeons. So if you wanted to teach software how to do cardiothoracic surgery and to do all of the diagnosis and all the pre-work, then you talk to somebody like Nikki, say, what do you do when you see this scan? What do you see when do when you see this x-ray? Um, what does this spot mean? And then programmers would program software to follow exactly those steps. And, and that would that would work. And there were some good expert systems at the time. Now, what we do is machine learning. So you don't have to talk to the experts in the world and try to program it. What you do is you tell the computer to learn from experience. So if you're trying to teach a computer to play chess, if you give it the rules, what you do is you say, play a game against me, against a human. And uh, every move it makes, a human responds and so on, until at the end, the computer's probably going to lose because it's just making random legal moves at every step. But then what happens is you go back to that, uh, you, the computer then looks at that game and every move that it made, if it lost the game, it would slightly lower the probability that it would make that same move in the same position next time. It still could, but if it had 20 random moves to choose from, the losing moves are given a slightly lower probability. And then he plays again, and he plays again, and again, and again, and he plays millions of games and hundreds of millions of games. Uh, you even get two computers um, playing against each other, each learning. Every time it loses, it penalizes the moves that it made. Every time it wins, it rewards the moves that it made. And that's how it learns. And a lot of AI now is built on this machine learning. That's why when you ask ChatGPT to be a, a farmer in Tasmania uh, working on precision agriculture, and it can give you really good advice about what you should do, it's not because the owners of ChatGPT have interviewed every expert and everybody around the world. They've gathered all this information and the AI has learned from which answers are the ones that are going to be the most valuable. I guess that's really important. And even now we're training AI ourselves. So when you have, whenever you do one of these captures where you have to identify traffic lights or bridges or motorcycles, what you're doing is helping the software understand what traffic lights and bridges and motorcycles look like. Okay, so that's an overview of the, just the basics of how AI works at the moment. 
The other thing that's happened, uh, especially now with the launch of ChatGPT, is that previously AI used to be internal and now it's internal and external. So what I mean by that is like lots of clients I've worked with, especially over the last 10 years, um, in their industries, AI is being used. But it's been used say, in healthcare to, uh, for radiologists to help them um, diagnose uh, and inspect um, images, medical images. It's been used in financial planning to help people with their financial, help financial planners uh, help their clients with their financial plans. It's been used in banking behind the scenes to see whether they're using, um, whether their transaction is possibly a fraud because it doesn't match your normal spending patterns. So a lot of that was internal. And now, with tools like ChatGPT, it's external. So you don't, in your organization, you don't have to have this big AI in infrastructure. You can just pick and choose tools like ChatGPT, which will help you. And they're completely external tools. It's like Google is external. So you can get a lot of value out of Google without having a Google built into your, your own internet or intranet. Okay, so that's a big change. Okay, so that's me talking about giving an overview of AI. Uh, what I really want to do today is open it up for questions, comments, discussion. So the next half an hour or so will be a combination of asking questions, answering questions, and uh, you can ask me questions. Uh, and if you want me to demonstrate some things, I'm happy to do that. Um, but the thing now to do is to ask questions. So the way we'll do this is any questions that you've got, type them in the chat. Okay, and I'll be the filter, I'll be the facilitator and moderator. So I'll have a look through the questions and I'll then I'll say, Janine, you asked this question. Um, if you, do you want to turn your mic on and expand on it? And you can if you want to. Uh, and then other people can jump in and answer it. Again, either in the chat or ideally if you turn your microphone on. Just to give you a few things to think about, you, you might already have some burning questions that you want to ask. If you do, type them in the chat now. Uh, otherwise, uh, just to give you some things to think about, let me very briefly give you some examples. Okay, so um, here are ways that, uh, and, I, and I positioned, I positioned this uh, session as the good, the bad, and the ugly. So this is like some of the good. Okay, so um, here are some ways that in the education sector, broadly in education, not only in schools, not only in universities, not only in tapes, but across them, here are 20 ways that people in the education sector can use AI. And this is specifically for education. There's lots of other ways you can use it as well, um, like for your internal productivity and performance. But uh, here are some 20, here are 20 ideas. Um, okay, good. There's some things coming up here, some questions coming up. I'm just going to leave that up for a tiny bit of time and we'll get some more questions. Keep asking in the chat. Good. Okay. Um, so that's a good. Let's look at the bad. Uh, so, some people here, if you're here, if you're from Australia, you know about Hanrahan, so it will all be ruined. And the uh, so Hanrahan was always pessimistic about whatever came up. And the, you, you remember, there's a lot of media hype, negative media hype, when ChatGPT was first launched about what that meant for education uh, in the education sector and what it meant for students being able to you know, cheat on their assignments and assessments. Um, here are some other um, risks, problems, and challenges with AI in the education sector. So again, I've got 20 of them here. They might, um, they might help to trigger some ideas for you or inspire some questions that you might want to ask. And um, yeah, okay, I'll leave that open for a bit. Okay, so some of them, if you want me to explain any of them, um, yeah, so luckily and so like even the one about creativity. So that's there. You see number seven, like what does it mean for creativity? And uh, number nine is what about the cost of it? What number 10 is that what if AI just churns out exactly the same thing over and over again or very similar things and it's not very customized? Um, number 13, out of date data. So chat GPT, um, the free version of it stops. Its, its database stops in September 2021. So some of the data is out of date. Um, then you talk about things like number 16, that uh, AI technical skills will we all need to learn how to use AI more effectively. Um, do we need to 
um, invest more for teachers and lecturers in training in how to use AI. And uh, number 18, is it going to increase the digital divide between the haves and the have-nots? Because who's got people who've got access to AI versus the people who don't. Okay. Good. Okay, so there's some questions here that have come in the chat room, which is fantastic. Uh, I can see some of the questions are specific to me, and I'm happy to answer them. But what I'm going to do is open them, open it up to everyone as well, because other people in the room might ha also have answers for them. Yeah, good, good, great questions. I'm going to give you a couple of examples of, uh, let me give you one example of AI being used at a university. Uh, this was, this happened quite recently, and uh, let me share this with you. Uh, so this is a university lecturer, and what he did with ChatGPT was, you can see here, here I'll read it out to you, so I followed this other uh, this other lecturer's suggestion, had my undergraduate class use ChatGPT for an assessment and for an assignment. And what he got them to do was he said, you have to use ChatGPT. But what we're going to do is let's see what answers, what essay ChatGPT creates for you, and then analyze it and critically analyze it, analyze it and grade it. And what he said is of, of all his 63 students, all the all of the results that ChatGPT um, blurted out had hallucination. So in uh, AI language, uh, so AI lies to you a lot, but um, it, it, we, we call them hallucinations, uh, rather than lies or outright um, mistruths. So um, there were problems, fake sources that AI completely made up a source, fake quotes or real sources, but quoted and used wrongly. So, you know, he found that all, all of the essays generated had problems in them. And I wonder, like, what do you think about that when you see that? And uh, it's kind of like a rhetorical question. But I think, to me, the most interesting thing about that is that he was smart enough to be teaching his students how to use the technology rather than just going out spend. Okay, and I understand there are reasons why you have to ban or prohibit or uh, reduce use of technology, but here's somebody who was using it um, as saying, here's technology that you will need to use when you leave and this school or this institution, in this case, university, let's see how you can use it and use it effectively. Okay, I'm seeing some comments here. Yes, yeah, so I'm seeing comments around, like it's a quite handy in the initial stages of undergraduate research process, finding key terms and concepts. So I, my frame around AI is that it's a great assistant. And then like, with other assistants, then you will then use it as a starting point. Um, yeah, reducing the workload. I've um, got some examples for you if you want to. Uh, assist in drafting reports, it works well. Great. Okay, so let's go back to this and uh, let's talk about this. I want to give you time for more questions and uh, just a couple of minutes or a minute to type in more questions. Keep asking the questions as we go and then we'll we'll address some of them now. Okay. All right, so I'm going to go through some of these questions. I'm going to open it up to the room. Uh, so the way I'll ask the question is I'll, I'll read out the question. I'll give the person who, who typed it in the opportunity to turn on their microphone and uh, uh, expand on it if you want to. And if you don't, that's okay. If there's a pause, then I'll just keep going. And then I'll open it up to the room. And again, if people want to respond to the question, respond. Um, ideally by turning on your microphone, uh, but uh, otherwise um, but in chat. And if not, if I have an opinion or, or if the question was for me, I'll, I'll answer it as well. So the first question I've got is from Catherine. Uh, it says, what do you do to address the, sorry, I got that wrong. Here's the correct answer issue. Do you have to ask it to verify info each time? Um, look, I'll, I'll take that question because I think that was mainly addressed to me. So uh, yeah, so the thing to understand about ChatGPT, and it goes back to like the machine learning that I mentioned earlier, it's a it's a people pleaser. So think of ChatGPT uh, like autocomplete. So you know, you take your phone, you're writing a text, and it autocompletes for you, tries to predict the next word or the rest of the sentence that would be most useful for you. That's what ChatGPT does as well. So the difference between that and your phone's autocomplete is ChatGPT has kind of swallowed up the whole internet to be able to then respond to you. Um, but 
it's basically trying to predict what you would find, what it thinks you would be happiest with as the answer. So yeah, sometimes that's why it makes up stuff. And uh, yeah, so it's a Catherine's question, like we, it, if you ask it to, or if you tell it point blank, and uh, sorry, that's, yeah, you don't even just say sorry, you say, that's wrong, can you do this? It will respond with, oh, I'm so sorry, I apologize for the confusion, blah, blah, blah. Um, here's the correct answer. So yes, you do have to verify information that it gives you. So if I, yeah, which probably isn't a surprise to you that um, I use ChatGPT a lot for my research, but if I say, give me 10 trends and innovations in agriculture that are going to be relevant for farmers in um, Southeast Australia, then every one of them, I, I get the list. But then I go to Google and do my own research to, to verify and to see whether it's relevant. So absolutely, you need to do that, Catherine. Okay, Catherine does say thank you for that. Uh, okay, so Leanne says, how do you recommend using generative AI in assessments as a positive position for students? So I hope, Leanne, that, that the one thing was the, the tweet that I shared with you already from that other lecturer who's doing exactly that. I've got some other examples around that, which, okay, so let me let me take you through this. So I was working with a, a, a a principals association and talking about how, how schools can use AI in their uh, for, for in the classroom uh, and for teachers. In this case, we picked an, picked an example of designing a lesson plan. So I said, I'll go, I'll go through. A, there's a whole. We did this as a like a demonstration. I'll show you some of the things that I prompted ChatGPT with. So some people will will be familiar with this. For others, this might be the first time you're seeing it being used in this way or seeing it used at all. Okay, so I'm saying you're an experienced, forward-thinking primary school teacher. When you prompt ChatGPT, it's always useful to start by giving it a role, okay, because it can take on many roles. If you start your conversation by giving it a role and say you are an experienced uh, primary school teacher, you're a farmer in far north Queensland, uh, you're a school principal uh, in, at an independent school, you're a... Um, careers advisor at a university, it's useful to start that way. Then I say design a lesson plan for grade five kids to understand the built environment. And it, and it designs, it comes up with a lesson plan. Um, so let me show you some of the things that are then asked you to do in that same conversation. Um, you've got a special needs child, in the, you've got an autistic child in the classroom, um, adapt the lesson plan for that. So it does that. Uh, how do we do this if it's online? if uh, people are working from home, if students are working from home. Then I went on to say, how could you invite students from another country, say China, to run this lesson together? And this is in Western Australia, so we live in the world's biggest time zone here in WA, and it makes totally makes sense for us to do collaborative learning with other people in our time zone. Well, it's currently the world's biggest time zone. China's the second biggest country population-wise in the world. India is not that far away, a couple of couple of time zones away and that is the biggest country so it totally makes sense for us to do collaboration around that and the sort of things chat gpt tells you uh, totally makes sense like how do you set this up how do you handle language problems and so on and then how can you adapt this so kids are using the technology that they're most comfortable with at home and again it adapts the lesson plan that way can you then build emotional intelligence skills into the lesson plan. Uh, we did another prompt, which I uh, asked one of the principals, what's your school, um, what are your school values? And then how can you build, then you can ask ChatGPT, how can we build these values of be, be bold, be, be brave, belong into the lesson plan? So it's integrated all the way through. Uh, how do you add diversity and inclusion into the lesson plan? So that, again, ChatGPT will do that. Um, add some ideas from Indigenous communities. Uh, in fact, when we did this prompt, one of the principals said, can you ask it to add a, uh, not welcome, an acknowledgement of country in the lesson plan? And sure enough, I did that prompt and it would add an acknowledgement of country at the start of the lesson plan. Um, give, and then give me some specific examples of innovations from primary school children having a positive impact on the built environment in the community. And ChatGPT came back with examples of, you know, you know cleaning up parks, uh, helping build, uh, fundraising for building a bridge or whatever. Uh, There's a whole bunch of them, but they tended to be quite generic. So then I said, make them more specific 
with schools, cities and countries. And then it gave me really specific examples that, again, that the, the teacher could then take that, research it, and then talk to their students about here's what's happening in, in the USA or Brazil. In fact, there weren't very many um, a lot of them were from the USA and from um, the UK. So I said then non-Western countries, and it did exactly the same thing with a whole bunch of other examples. Okay, and then you can even ask ChatGPT, what other questions can I ask you to help me improve this lesson plan? So you can ask ChatGPT to help you help, help yourself. A couple of others. We then said, let's go really broad and say, imagine the traditional school system doesn't exist. In other words, we no longer have in-person classrooms with students, <laughs> students all the same age, approximately the same demographics, living close to each other. What would you do? How would the school system be replaced? And again, ChatGPT came up with several things that you could do that if we didn't have a school system. Um, and the final example I've got here for you is give me some examples of how, how this is already happening in the real world. Okay, and these were, these were independent schools who have quite a lot of uh, agency over how their school runs. And so they were really keen to see what can we do to make, um, yeah, make education better for our students within the constraints of the school curriculum. Okay, so, okay, so there are some examples. Uh, let's continue. Uh, yeah, any comments, questions about that, please feel free to ask me questions, uh, make comments, or, as I said, talk about how you're using it yourself in the classroom. But I did that one specifically for, um, she was going to say Saba, because she's, uh, that's a similar question, but uh, Leanne said, how can you use it in assessments? Um, Leanne, I might ask you to ask her uh, if you want to turn your microphone on, because uh, you said, how do you recommend using it in assessments. Um, so if you want to expand that. Yep, hi, thanks for the um, so the example so far. So more um, if you want to encourage students to use AI rather than discourage, mm -hmm. is there certain examples or assessment types that you would recommend? So looking at redesigning our traditional assessments for our mm -hmm. students. Um, yes, so it, was, it, was that last tweet that I gave you useful of that other lecturer who said, Let's use it for the way that I would have been doing it pre-2023, and uh, but let's use it to then analyse that. Is that what you meant? Or? Yes, yes, that's correct. Yeah, so that's an example of that, to say that, um, you know, what we need to teach now is not how to write essays, because we've got a we've got some software that can do that but we need to we need to teach critical thinking we need to teach um being skeptical without being cynical um and we need to teach those skills is that what you mean or can you do you want to expand on that happy to yeah probably more like um you know when you recommend sort of using the AI it could be more as an assistive tool, maybe for brainstorming. So would you sort yes. of recommend that maybe, you know, so we can see that it's a student's own work. So we see their processes and their steps. So encouraging to use AI, um, see where they brainstorm, see where they've led. And do you feel that using the AI could actually give them a broader perspective or increase their critical thinking? Or do you think that the, the machine learning really wouldn't give them any new ideas, would just regurgitate what's been in the past? Um, but it, it actually does generate new ideas because that's one of the things that's, um, so the, by the way, this AI is called generative AI because it generates rather than just analyzes and monitors. So if you see this, uh, so the, the the G in GPT is for generative. Um, I don't really need to know what GPT means, but the G is generative. And uh, so it absolutely can generate new material. And I've seen examples of people have tested exactly that. Like, is it only drawing on what it knows from the past, uh, or can it do absolutely can it do novel things? And it absolutely can generate more. Um, I know schools where they are uh, where their primary school classes students are using AI in the classroom uh, to generate ideas. So there might be things like, uh, you know, like one of the ways I've used AI is I say I've got a product, uh, which is a conference presentation or a masterclass, which has got these objectives, give me 10 attractive titles for that masterclass uh, of a blog post. So it's, it's, it is useful for creativity. Um, and it's useful, as I said, as a starting point, because then I take those ideas and I say, I like this, I like that, but not exactly. So yes, it can be, it can be like another 
Um, it can be like an assistant, like a teacher or a teacher's assistant in the classroom to help students. Yeah, and Leanne's a comment about there's a lot of hype about plagiarism and students will lose the ability to think and be creative and rely too heavily for daily activities. Um, yeah, look, at, absolutely, that's a risk. That is a risk that uh, we become too dependent on our machines. It's just like in the old days, we used to have to remember phone numbers. And now the, uh, all the phone numbers are in our contacts on our, phone, on our devices. Yeah, okay, so Keith has saying been following the development of Microsoft Copilot with AI embedded in between Office products, and I noticed that Bing has already embedded AI into searches, would be interested in comments on Copilot. Uh, so yes, yeah, so this is this actually opens up the conversation that it's not just about ChatGPT, there are many other AI tools available, uh, ChatGPT is just one of them. Microsoft, which actually has made a big investment in ChatGPT, in OpenAI, uh, now in their Bing search engine, and They've, they've created this thing called Copilot. So with Word documents, with Excel, with uh, PowerPoint, it's now got a little uh, AI Copilot. And it's better than, remember Clippy in the old days? They would come clip the paper clip, which is very annoying. This is not that. It's much better than that. Uh, so yes, it's absolutely now going to be an assistant that's there for, for all of us to use if you use Microsoft products. Um, if you don't, here's another tool. Here's one of those that I had to show you later. It's uh, if you use Chrome as your web browser, there's a Chrome extension called usechatgpt.ai. It's a free extension. And what it does is any Chrome window you've got open. So any anytime you're browsing the web, or if you use Gmail, you can highlight some text and immediately tap into ChatGPT, Bing, Bard, and a couple of other AI tools. So if I'm writing an email, I can highlight a paragraph and say, change the tone to make it more friendly or more professional or make it shorter. And I can choose, am I going to use Bing, Bard or ChatGPT? So again, like, is that cheating or is that just using the technology that's available to us? And I like to think it's the latter. So yes, yeah, so Microsoft Copilot is the Microsoft version of that. And here's another one, if you're not using the Microsoft suite of tools. But let's face it, lots of people here are using that already. Let's see what else there is. Um, how can ed educators, uh, Saba says, how, do, how can educators effectively use uh, AI like ChatGPT and BARD into the classroom for secondary students? And again, I think there's opportunities there. So one is for the educators themselves to do things like design lesson plans. And the other one is for um, the students to use AI in the classroom. Um, it's a bit hard in many uh, government schools around Australia because most, I think most, uh, many, certainly uh, many uh, education departments have banned the use of tools like ChatGPT in the classroom. Um, and I hope this temporary. I hope this temporary until we figure out a way to use it effectively. So as an example, Samsung banned its engineers from using ChatGPT because its engineers were in good faith without realizing it. Uh, some of their software developers uploaded some of their software code to ChatGPT to ask for advice on improving the code without thinking about the consequences that they were then making all this proprietary code, which hadn't even been released, uh, available to open AI. And so they banned it. So Samsung banned all the engineers from, from doing it, said you lose your job if you use ChatGPT. But they also started developing their own AI so their engineers could get the value without the risks. Now, we don't all have the resources of Samsung, but I'm hoping that's, that's going to happen in the education sector that will start looking at AI and how we can use it, uh, just like we look at how we can use Google and calculators. Yeah, Leanne says a lot of hype about plagiarism. Oh, let, let me show you another thing. This came up um, a couple of days ago. I was speaking to a, a client in the education sector. I won't say who it was, but um, uh, another useful thing around, another useful tool, which is not ChatGPT, is this paraphraser tool, paraphraser.io. Uh, so speaking to another school principal and here, or again, at this group of school principals, and one of them said, I use it to write my newsletter. A start of term newsletter to parents asked it to compose a newsletter for me and he, he said it came out a little bit too formal for what I wanted but it was a really good starting point now you can use a tool like paraphraser.io to paste in some text say from a newsletter and then say make it um, 
make it more friendly or less less formal or change the words and you can do that exactly that so again you can go to paraphraser.io you can use a free version for that if chat gpt doesn't give you the answer that you want and if you think that's good wait till you get a load of this imagine using chat gpt to generate some ideas and then gpt0 which is one of the main uh, ai plagiarism tools you paste your text into there and it tells you this was mostly written by an ai and then you go to paraphraser and get it to refine the text and then plug it back into gpt0 and uh, as long as it says it's still produced by an AI, then you can go back and forth and back and forth. And if you think students aren't doing that, uh, I think you're deluded. This is this is exactly what students are doing. Uh, so we've got these tools that we use for productivity and performance. And of course, they can be used in other ways as well. And it, it's really getting us to rethink, is this the way that we should be doing assessments? There was another university lecturer I uh, read about, and he said, uh, because he wants his students to use chat GPT and he's told them there's no excuse for you ever to write a bad essay ever again because chat GPT will, will generate that essay so I'm not going to be assessing the quality of your writing I'm going to be assessing the quality of your thinking so he's then saying we don't need you to learn essay writing skills but you need to do other things like critical thinking and then he cites our online courses on prompt engineering I'm going to recommend a couple of people to follow um not not i it's not i'm not one of them but I'm, i'll recommend a couple soon uh okay i'll go to peter's question can how can adult educators use ai so, so the facilitated teacher is not replaced and again i think it comes back to ai is your assistant it's not going to replace you so the world economic forum says that um you know, tens of millions of jobs are going to be replaced by ai and it's going to create a whole bunch more I and mean, they're not the same jobs unfortunately so it's not the same people who can simply switch into a job that ai can um can, has created and um, but the other side of it is for most of us it's not going to replace our jobs but it might replace some of our tasks that we do so instead of having to and it'll or, or assist in, in those tasks instead of having to write a start of term newsletter from scratch you can get AI to generate a first draft and then you do a little bit of editing. Uh, so when I run my leveraging AI workshop, the promise that I make for people who attend the workshop is that you spend two, three, four, up to half a day with me. And I guarantee that when you walk out of here, if you implement these ideas, you will save at least half a day a week of your time. And it's mostly in things like admin, uh, writing, uh, checking, scheduling, those sort of things. And you, you save a day a week from now on from learning these tools at the start. So absolutely it can be really useful for us, if nothing else, for productivity and performance. Oh, actually, Kelly's question. Uh, hi, Kelly. Good to see you here. Uh, there are many uses of AI by educators that could reduce their workload. And I hope you've seen some examples of this already. And today I'm focusing specifically a bit uh, on AI in the education sector. So I haven't really given you lots of examples about how AI can write your emails or um, do scheduling, automatic scheduling for you and other tools like that. But it's really useful for productivity. One of the people I'm going to recommend, um, her expertise is in productivity. So we'll, we'll get to that soon. Uh, Michael says, what about integration of VR and AI? Yes, so virtual reality and AI. Uh, so VR is already part of AI because uh, the virtual reality um, technology requires AI, artificial intelligence, to be able to understand scenarios and scenes and so on. Uh, but yes, there will be more of that built into it uh, in the future. So Apple's just uh, announced its big VR headset. It's a bit clumsy looking at the moment, but it's a, it's a, because of Apple's huge marketing and database, uh, there's a chance that VR is going to now accelerate. Um, I'm not as confident as I am with AI, but it's something that's definitely going to happen in our future. Uh, Steve says more of a corporate slant. Uh, yes, so Steve, I know is in education, but also looking at the uh, corporate side of it. Uh, time is money. So yes, to, rather than start with a blank piece of paper, you have a written piece. Uh, the challenge then becomes for the student to customize and value add to personalize and yes agreed exactly right um joe a couple of people have asked me about the government education sector there's some possibilities of me working in that area uh, i do some work in the wa public service and um, there's some department of education people there i haven't had a lot of discussion in that area but it's certainly an area that i think 
um, governments more broadly need to look at this, look at AI, and specifically in the education sector as well. A couple of other little AI tools that you might find useful, especially Kelly, since you asked about, and Steve and others asked about um, just in terms of admin tasks. Uh, so this other tool called MeetGeek. MeetGeek is not a dating site for engineers. It's an automatic, um, it joins your online meetings and does automatic transcribing and recording and summarizing. So this is a Zoom meeting that we're on now live. And uh, um, I would have got, so MeetGeek, because I asked you to register, MeetGeek wouldn't join this, but I'm going to upload the recording to MeetGeek afterwards and it'll do a transcript it'll analyze a meeting and talk about um it, it, it there's some sort of emotion sensing as well so if you're not if you're doing a zoom meeting or a team's meeting and someone raises a concern meet geek will flag that as concerns seem to come up at that point in the meeting and then five minutes after the meeting's complete it emails you a summary of the of what happened in the meeting so this is really useful for from an admin point of view I reckon that'll do for, um, I was going to give you some other tools, but also Ke Kelly has said, will this create a greater gap between schools that have up-to-date technology? Yes, Kelly, yes, it will. So there's a there's a question about two things. So one is a digital divide. So some people don't have access, to have very little access to digital technology at all. And um, secondly, it's even if you have the digital technology, uh, you may have noticed on my list of problems and challenges, uh, so we've got that, uh, so that 18 was a digital divide, and I thought I had one about, that's a number six, lack of interoperability, that's what that means. So you've got the tech, so you've got certain technology that you're using, and the new AI technology can't build on top of that. It's uh, helped a little bit by the fact that we're using external tools like ChatGPT now, rather than having to have everything internal, but still there is, there is that challenge. Okay. I want to give you a couple of things to, to end up with, to take, take ideas away. So I hope you've got some value, even now with what we've covered, that you can say, I can use this right now. Uh, as soon as we finish that, you're going to get some value from it and you can um, actually make it, make it work for you. A couple of things to finish up with. So here's one. This is one from um, an educator. And you can read his article on LinkedIn, My Real Fear for AI, AI in Education. And it's kind of like everyone here in the room, uh, it's like a small minority here, it's self-selecting, right? Because we're already, the fact that you're here or you're watching the recording means that you're interested in AI and in the education sector. But um, as he says here, education systems may not be able to keep up or may not want to keep up. And so there's a problem or potential for relevancy and um, lack of relevancy. I've got some resources for you and a couple of other people to follow. So for me, uh, what I've got for you, if you go to, you can actually snap the QR code now on your um, on your screen on that slide, or, or you can go to gihanperera.net forward slash extras. So go there and what you get is you can download both full copies of my last two books, Disruption by Design and Disrupted, which are all about innovation, creativity, not, not in education, but more broadly, and it's useful for all of us as leaders. There's also an audio program around leading in uncertainty. There, and today, especially relevant today, there's a 16 question assessment, are you ready for AI? And you can rate yourself, either for yourself or for organization, for your so yourself, your team, or your organization. And at the end, it'll email you a customized report for you uh, based on your responses. And, and also there's some worksheets that you can use with your team to be more future ready. Three people I recommend that you follow. I mean, I follow lots of people around AI, but um, three of my really go-to people that I really follow a lot and very closely, um, one, Sam McLaren, she, she's kind of an expert in the real estate uh, space, but uh, she publishes an AI newsletter. So who was asking, I can't remember who was asking about online courses or prompts, uh, ideas and prompts. Uh, Sam publishes some fantastic stuff and it's not specific to real estate. Her examples, some of them are, but you can see very quickly how to make them work um, in, in your area as well. 
so she's fantastic. Uh, Joanna Penn, I've been following for more than a decade. Uh, she's been my go-to futurist uh, around AI for a long time. She's an author, and she also talks about writing. And so she uses AI as an assistant for writing her books, fiction and nonfiction. Um, so she's got a podcast called The Creative Pen, which I've been listening to for a long, long, long time. Um, and I mentioned Donna earlier. So Donna McGeorge is an expert on productivity. And in the last few months, like she's really grabbed hold of AI and is using uh, and has been investigating the use of AI for improved productivity and performance. Next month, I think she's releasing her book, The Chat GPT Revolution. Um, and it's about exactly AI for productivity. So she's my go to person for anything around productivity. Um, so there's a whole bunch of others, but I reckon if you if you follow them, if you just look look out for them on LinkedIn or just do a Google search, you'll find them pretty quickly. Uh, I run a masterclass. Uh, it's sort of around leveraging AI, and this is very it's very practical. So today I gave you a little bit of a glimpse of some of the tools you could use. I uh, hope I answer some of your questions, but this masterclass really takes you through some really practical stuff around AI. It's very practical and interactive. Uh, I've run it both online and in person. The online version, we can run it one of two ways. And I think the way that's worked most effectively is we split it in two. So it's a three hour masterclass in person, so roughly half a day. But in the online version, we did half of it and um, introduced some of the ideas. Then four weeks late, so then there was a four week gap where people had a little project. Everyone decided on a project they were going to work on and then came back four weeks later and we had the second half of it. So that works really effectively because you get the chance to actually try it out for yourself. And these are things you can try out for yourself. Um, you know, ChatGPT is free. I recommend you pay the 20 US dollars a month or the 30 Aussie dollars a month for the paid version. It's a dollar a day to have your own assistant. I think it's worthwhile. You can make the decision for yourself. But either way, it's really powerful. Um, but it's not only about ChatGPT. And there's some other tools, and I'm, I mentioned a couple of them for you here. And as I mentioned earlier, so my promise from this masterclass is that you'll save half a day a week after it. So just from what you learn from that, put the ideas into practice and you'll save at least half a day a week. I was talking to a client of mine um, a couple of days ago about this, and she said she needs to con convince uh, others on her team. And I said, well, you save half a day a week. And um, from now on, and she goes, oh, that's all I need. Um, boss is going to go, yep, let's do that. If that's what it's, if that's what we get for investing half a day uh, for our team. If you want to know more about that, dehanpereira.com or um, get in touch with me. Um, just, you know, all my contact details are available easily online. Uh, my last message for you is uh, thank you so much for being here and asking questions and being involved. Um, don't wait for everything to be perfect. Don't wait for all your ducks to line up in a row. Start before you're ready because the world, as we know, is not going to wait for you. Thanks everyone. Hope you enjoy the rest of your day. I'll see you in the future. Bye for now.